Hello, Longevity Junkies. We are so glad that you are here and joining us for this awesome celebration. We do wish that we could be in person around the world doing book signings live with um, all of you because for obvious reasons we cannot. So we're so appreciative that Premier Collectibles with Lives is hosting this live signing. So we will be able to do a little bit of live signing and have a little bit of a somewhat personal discussion, be it virtually better than nothing. Thank you, Rodney. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Becker, on your platform. I am super excited. And as Dr. Becker said, you know, it's so awesome because the book was picked up in like nine different languages around the world. If things were different and the mm. world was what it used to be, we would be traveling right now and meeting everybody. But a huge shout out, uh, absolutely, to Premier Collectibles for allowing us to be able to do this, a live signing so you guys could kind of participate and be part of it. Now, we're also doing a Q&A today. And of course, if you see the link right down here on the bottom, uh, if you want to jump in and you want to ask a question, of course, you get on the link, you get an autographed book and so on and so forth, and you get your question asked. But before we kind of jump into the questions and stuff like that, the big giant yeah. question and elephant in the room is the book, right? Um, I kind of think because everybody's been so awesome and so incredible, every everyone knows about the Forever Dog. It feels like it, but I know that there's a lot of people out there that haven't heard of it. Well, and I think also we've not had necessarily time. We haven't done a Facebook Live. We were just talking about this. Our last Facebook Live was, I think, three months ago because we've yeah. just been so busy. We literally are a team of three. Rodney um, is neurotically passionate, and you can tell your story about uh, his obsession with gathering research. So. Rodney gathered research, I did the writing, B, our amazing tech, graphic designer, all things coordination, uh, online help. This team of three, we worked really, really hard this summer to, to help bring this book to fruition. But out of that, a lot of people maybe haven't heard the backstory. So this was actually your idea. Well, I mean, I got a huge, a huge fascination for longevity, right? And this was kind of personal for me there was the personal side of why I wanted to write the book. And then of course, you know, the science junkie in me, why I wanted to write the book. I've always had a fascination for the oldest lived dogs in the world. Like the number one question people ask each other when they see each other with their dogs and they bump into each other in the park, aside from what's your dog's name is like, oh my gosh, how old is your dog, it's right? True. And that I is, never knew how old was old enough, right? I mean, as a first time dog owner, which kind of sounds crazy now, but as a first time dog owner, I didn't know what the average lifespan of a dog would be. I Was it 10, was it 20, was it 30? I had no idea. And it wasn't until I started to do research and started to dig in different places around the world that you were seeing these dogs, like Maggie, the Kelpie from Australia, live to be 30 yeah. years old. So I wanted my dogs to live to be 30 years old. And Well, and I, th I think the big question you had was, you know, we're told how long dogs can live. Like, you know, this is average lifespan is, you know, we're told is, let's say 12 of a breed or God forbid six or eight if you have a giant breed dog. That's a, you just, you take those numbers and you just assume that that's what it is. But I think you've always been interested in the whys. Like, is it genetic? Are these ultra long lived dogs, are they outliers? Are the owners doing something different? Like why, why do some dogs live to be exceptionally old and some don't? And the challenging part of it is, okay, why did these dogs live to be so old? So we started to travel around the world together. That's when we kind of teamed up. And we traveled to different countries where some of these, the longest lived dogs ever, um, and their owners, we got to sit down with them and ask their owners, how on earth did they raise these extraordinarily, yeah. extraordinarily long lived dogs? Now we could come up with our own reasons as yeah. to why this was happening easily. Just put together Theories. a dog book, Theories. write it all together, throw it out there and there's the book but we wanted the world's greatest scientists yeah. to be able to break that down. Longevity scientists, Nobel Prize winning scientists. Here's the data, now decode this for pet parents. And for me, as a proactive wellness veterinarian, that is what I eat, eat and breathe and live. That, I mean, that's what I do at night, that's what I do on the weekends. I'm just obsessed with the physiology and the science behind why some physical cartons thrive and why some bodies don't they wither they're recurrently broken and then they don't have an exceptionally not only they don't have exceptional health span but they also don't have exceptional lifespan like why is that so when he said to me three years ago hey 
we know about these outliers. We know about these old, old dogs. We ha met, we've been introduced to a few of these top tier longevity scientists. What if we go and dissect the lives, the background, everything about these long lived dogs, talk to the owners about what they did and didn't do. But then what if we go back to the top scientists? And that is where I got really excited and get the science, have these experts in their field reverse engineer these ancient dogs. But what was so cool is some of these scientists were already, they were doing cheek swabs on these older dogs. Some of these scientists already analyzing the DNA from these old dogs, which I thought was also really fascinating because they already had a beat on the why and that it was not necessarily genetic. And although genes do play in obviously to longevity, but there's so many other factors now epigenetically, which means the environment that surround your dog's DNA actually plays much more of a role than the DNA itself. And that was a big learning lesson for us for the genetics piece of it. Absolutely. Now, as this book started to come together, more and more pet parents, more and more people were reaching out, hey man, I want my dog to live forever. Like, yeah. what do we have to do you know, what are some tips, what are some tricks, what are some hacks that we can do to help maybe extend the health span of our pets, which in return could potentially expect, you know, extend the lifespan life. of our pets. So this was really important. We didn't want the book, the book to be too science heavy, right. but we wanted there to be enough science in it, right? And then also the cool part about this, and I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up, was of course, one of the names as well on the book mm would be our incredible science writer. We brought in one of the world's best science writer to call us out on our own studies, right? Because it's easy to cherry pick on studies today, right? Or read a study maybe incorrectly or whatever the case may be. But we kind of Red Army, Blue Army did. We brought somebody in who'd call us out and say, no, this study, I think there's a better study out there. This one is kind of flawed, so on and so forth. Yeah. And be able to break it down very layman for you. Yeah. But if you're a young aspiring veterinarian, maybe a vet student, um, a young scientist, you'll still love the science. That's one of the favorite things I love about Kristen Loberg is that her gift is in taking, um, we, we gave her a thousand studies and we said, the, <laughs> the, we, these are the thousand studies we're using. I wrote up the science related to the dogs and the oldest dogs and what they didn't do, didn't, did and didn't do. Kristen's job was to say this research paper, this research coming from here, yes, no, yes, no, and then help us write it in a way that everyone could digest it, understand it. So if you want the research and the hard hitting science, it's there. If you just want like the practical, tell me what to do, it's there too. But I would say that whole tell me what to do is like the number one thing people say. Absolutely. Is they want, the, most people, certainly all of you watching right now, you would do anything to give your dog, not just extra time, but extra health in the body that your dog has been given. We don't wanna watch our dogs fall apart piece by piece over time. In fact, we wrote this book to actually prevent regret because regret is a powerful emotion that doesn't allow you to forgive yourself if you didn't know enough or didn't feel like you did enough with another animal. It lingers and it, it, it can cripple you in making good decisions going well, forward. Well, uh, you know, I am you, most of you that are watching, a pet parent who was affected uh, by the mistakes that he made and born of that desperation was inspiration, right? Every day I'll sit down and talk, like I could just see all the comments blowing up in the comment section, mm -hmm. but how many pet specialty retailers, how many indie esque sort of pet food manufacturers, how many people will come up to you and tell you the story, hey man, um, you know, when my dog or my cat got sick, I didn't know what the heck to do. I then I knew that I had to take the, you know, the power into my own hands. I had to take the rain into my own hands. I started to, have to do my own research. I started to find some answers. I took control of my pet's diet. I changed my dog's life. If I only knew then what I know now, and it, people have started companies and people have started stores because they've wanted to inspire other people to not fall sort of down the same route that us first time pet owners have, have you know, fallen into. There's nothing worse as a, is when you go into your veterinarian and your beautiful veterinarian says, hey man, this is kind of where we're at in this situation. Um, so, you know, it's about quality of life at this moment, yeah. at this point, right? And quality of life is important, but for a lot of other people, that's not enough, right? Like we want other options. So one of the key drivers for me in putting this book together was so, you know, a lot of people did, don't have to go through what I went through. And what a lot of other pet parents that I'm sure have gone through as well, especially all of you that are watching, I know all of you, we've all gone through a situation where like, oh my gosh, I, I just, I know so much more than I did then. And for me, that was kind of, um, 
the piece that healed my heart was putting this book together. Well, and for me, the, the whole hashtag forever dog, what that means to me is that commitment you make to your dog, it's a quiet promise that you make to your dog that from this day forward, you are going to be an empowered, knowledgeable advocate for your dog's physical, mental, and emotional well-being. That this is a thing between you and your dog that you are not going to have regret. And you're, you're not going to look back and say, if I only would have known. Forever Dog is about our commitment as guardians to not have regret through knowledgeable, wise decisions. And the only, you don't know what you don't know. So the only way that you're going to be able to make better choices is to have the knowledge available. You have to know what to not do to know what to do. And there isn't a manual of what to do, which is why we wrote the book. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? It was the hardest thing in the world was to write a damn book. You're only allowed like 450 pages. Like if you allow me just to talk about like turmeric, I could do that in 800 pages. Like give me, give me a thousand pages. I'll write about turmeric. We really needed like an, we needed like an encyclopedia, like in the olden days where they had like the 12 sets of the Britannicas. We could have done a 12 volume set. We totally could have. Absolutely. Right. So it was like, so, you know, and, and, and this, this kind of was the hard pill for me to swallow. Right. It was every day talking to like awesome Brian over at Harper and Karen Rinaldi and the incredible people that helped put this book together. And they're like, 400 pages, 400 yep. pages. Hold it there. Man, it's almost impossible to say all the things that we want to say in 400 pages. But I think we got to touch on everything, right? We got to touch on everything with a 400 page limit, yeah. which, you know, was was my hope well, anyways, initially. Exactly. And that whole blueprint, honestly, truly, if we, we if we got down into um, covering every disease process at every life stage, it would be a 12 volume set. But I am so happy that I firmly believe each and every one of you reading this book will get done and say, out of my confusion, I do have clarity. And out of me feeling like I'm overwhelmed and I don't know what to do, I can make a game plan. And that's the most important piece is that you start somewhere uh, where you feel comfortable at a pace that feels comfortable to you because all we have with our dogs is time. And so we might as well make the time and put forth daily learning as we replace old things in our house with healthier non-toxic things that's a step in the right direction when we begin recognizing hey i can do this and this and this for cardio or i can do this for emotional well-being or i can do this for this purpose each incremental step that you change and make to improve the health and well-being of your dog physically mentally emotionally that's a step in the right direction and it does a whole host of things physiologically mentally in terms of reducing stress that are fantastic for your dog's body i like how you're starting well <laughs> here we go in keeping with the theme of live signings you're supposed to be We're signing. signing so we've got like like i don't know if you guys saw the photos online of like the mountains of like books and then we've got all these incredible book plates i mean they're beautiful, beautiful book plates. So we're signing all of these. Yes, hundreds and hundreds. And I'm not sure how many people have sort of jumped in and they wanted the autograph copy. So thank so you. Nice. And then we have a whole bunch of questions. Now, typically when you watch our Facebook lives, like there's thousands of comments going through the comment section, we can't yes. answer them all, yes. right? Um, so there is a portal for the people that if you're new and you're just jumping in, there's the link that you see down there below, premiercollectibles.com forward slash forever. Um, submit your questions there. submit your questions and then we'll jump in here and we will start answering some of the questions so yes the book was masterfully as you had mentioned uh broken into sections so when you think about longevity as a whole like you know when you sit down with these longevity scientists right you put together an incredible d-o-g-s breakdown of how this book goes so d for diet of course um o for optimal exercise Movement, exercise right g for genetics and s for stress and there's a lot of different types of stresses at home you've got like physical stress you've got emotional stress you've got chemical stress so we wanted to break those down because a lot of people don't realize that hey man you could have diets on lockdown dude i'm feeding the organic ethically raised best food in the entire world but if you don't have the other things secured and locked down these are things that can actually affect overall lifespan aka i gotta say as well. one thing about these amazing scientists so first of all uh, some of my veterinary colleagues and not just veterinary colleagues we've had other doctors say to us how'd you get an interview with so and so we have to tell the story that i just want you to know i'm done with one of my sheets <laughs> you're so fast it takes me forever um, to sign. we did get in to the top 
labs around the world. Like we've interviewed Sachin Panda and Dr. David Sinclair at the Harvard Longevity Lab. We went to the Sock Institute. We've been to Broad Institute, MIT. We have been to like amazing longevity researchers doing stellar cutting edge research. Other people said to us, you're never going to get an interview with so-and-so because they don't take interviews. Like the, um, last year, someone was busy getting their Nobel Prize, didn't have time for the interview, so we thought. But here's what's so awesome. We did not get turned down for a single interview because when I emailed them, this is what I said. I said, I'm Karen Becker, and I'm writing a book with Rodney about dog longevity, and we just really love dogs a lot. And we know that you love dogs and because we love dogs and you love dogs, we think you should talk to us about dogs. And do you know, every single one of them said, okay, every single one of them. So, um, faith redeemed in all of humanity because dogs yet again, unite everyone. Well, dogs the, are amazing. Well, the coolest part about it too, was during the journey, the scientists that we would meet, we would introduce them to other scientists. These guys would all sort of connect together and web together. This was the, the funnest part for me on this journey was getting everyone to meet everyone. I know when we were talking to the microbiologists and we would talk about, let's say Darcy, the little 21 year old, beautiful, I don't know if Darcy was a purebred Yorkie. Yeah, I do Apologies Yorkie if he wasn't. Yeah. Yorkie mix. Yeah. 21 years old. When we were telling the microbiologists in the United States, they're like, oh my gosh. Send us a sample. Send us a sample. Let's analyze his gut biome, right? When we were uh, talking to Dr. Eniko from Hungary, by the way, when we talk about genetics, now genetics is, is pretty deep. It's like a very science esque type of talk. But here's something really cool. They're, the scientists down there in Hungary have built like this supercomputer and they've been analyzing some of these long lived dogs like the beautiful dog that we talk about in the mm. book, Bushki, Bushki, who lived to be 27 years old. These scientists have been like not only just sort of going in and checking out the genetics of the animal, but they built a supercomputer where the computer could analyze the genetics of these long lived dogs, all these dogs in their 20s versus the dogs like let's say in the United States and Canada that are only living to be like 14 or 15 at most if you're lucky what are the differences and they're starting to narrow down these special longevity genes mm -hmm. that if your dog has boy oh boy man you and, hit the jackpot and the and all dogs have sirtuins so when we talked to dr david sinclair an amazing brilliant longevity researcher he was talking about how in the veterinary world Veterinarians aren't yet taught how to activate sirtuin pathways, which are these longevity pathways that naturally occur in our dogs. And I think one of the most empowering things for me was that uh, all of the scientists saying, dogs genetics are not a death sentence. And it's pretty empowering. Yes, genetics can hit you square and center in the head. If your dogs are missing genes, they're missing genes and they're going to not be totally healthily well because they're missing genes. However, just because dogs have a genetic predisposition to certain yeah. things is not a death sentence. And that was super empowering for me. I'm gonna sign a book. Oh, you're getting into the book. So it's pretty cool too, the way that we, the book has kind of been broken down. So yes, you can start to read it from beginning to end. No, you don't have to. You can start to jump in to certain sections. There's like these gray sections that we have. I don't know if you guys can see that in there. These are your gems. So in every chapter, we break it down with gems. I was just talking to my next door neighbor who's maybe watching right now, Sue. Hello, Sue. Sue got a copy of the book, an advanced copy, and she said to me yesterday, she's like, you know, I when I have time, I'm going to read the entire book. But I was just going into the gems in the trying meantime, to pull she out. she likes the cliff notes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was trying to pull out the gems directly out of the book. All right, you want to uh, grab you want to grab a couple of questions yeah, while we're do, doing this. Yeah, let's do. Let's right. do. Kaylee says so many beneficial supplements and additives in the world, which there are. Kaylee, Kaylee is from Ontario. Um, Shout out to my fellow Canadian and happy, happy Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to all of the Canadians who are watching right now. By That's the way, correct. It is Canada Thanksgiving. So Kaylee says, what's the most important for supplements? What's the most important? I don't want to overwhelm the bowl with a ton of powders and toppers. Kaylee, such a good question. We don't want you to overload the bowl with a ton of toppers. First of all, we want to make sure that, um, so we want to be clear that supplements are different from food. That food is food. And you can put, you know, a bite of carrot, a bite of kohlrabi, whatever, open up your fridge. And as long as it's not onions, you know, I would avoid corn and potatoes too. But as long as it's not onions, like, Open up your fresh food drawers and see what's see what's dented or dinged or see what part you can cut off and share with your dog. Those are foods and you're welcome to offer as many bite-sized morsels of food as you want as treats. 
it, it, that your dog will take. Not all dogs eat everything, but that's the cool part about learning this journey is that you get to feed different foods and figure out what your dog's preferences are. When it comes to supplements, we want you to know why you're giving specific supplements. Yeah, one of the things that, one of the tips that I can also give you, and you highlight it where, you know, you're, there's so many like powders and toppers on top of the food bowl. What was important for me, you know, there was a whole host of herbs that I knew like that my dogs needed, right? Whether it was for a health situation, Sammy who was dealing with cancer and ALS, or maybe it was just Shuby, my dog, who's healthy, but I wanted to give her preventatives. When I would start to look down in the bowl, Dr. Becker, it started to look like a giant mountain of powder. Yeah. And then I started to realize, man, I wouldn't want to eat like no. that, right? Like, no. my gosh, if every day I had to eat one of my meals and it was just full of all these different types of powders on the top, no thank you, not interested. Yeah. So one of the tips that I can give you, Kaylee, once you've narrowed down, as Dr. Karen Becker said, you know, you know, why do I need this powder? Why is this supplement, let's just say, in my mix, in my toolbox, I started to give my dogs power smoothies throughout the day. So I would use like freeze dried, by the way, works wonders. And we have recipes for bone broth and mushroom broth in the book. Really awesome. So we got to, so it, really it's broke. Awesome. Yeah, it's broken down with a lot of like flavor toppers, right? Like if you're going to make it. So I would use um, freeze dried bricks. And with a lot of my favorite herbs, of course, that are in the book, I would mix them and blend them in. And, you know, just maybe like an hour before lunch, I would put those down. Dogs would get the power smoothie and I wouldn't ruin their meals so they could enjoy their meals without having 10,000 different types of supplements and things like and that. And I have to say this when clients, and first of all, I see a lot of awesome people in this Facebook life are my clients. Mwah! Shout out to all y'all. I love you guys. You all, many of my clients, know that on the very first appointment, when I make you bring in all your supplements and line them up, and I say, okay, tell me what all these are for. When I have clients say, mm, I don't remember about this one, and I, I don't know about this one, and I, I, I watch someone say that this was good, or someone told me to feed this one, but a lot of times my clients didn't even know why they were giving supplements. So first of all, Kaylee, know what you're giving and why. There needs to be a specific purpose for the supplement you're giving. So let's just say that you have a golden retriever and you know that your golden has early onset progressive retinal atrophy, an eye degenerative condition, and you are fighting, warring against vision loss, which is an awesome goal. The second you get that diagnosis of PRA or the second you do your DNA swab and it says your dog is carrying PRA, support the eyes. Yes, really good. So let's say that you get that diagnosis and you decide that you're gonna add in zizanthin and lutein for eye support, fantastic. Then you know your, why you're giving that supplement and then the question is what can you put it in to make sure that the meal remains beautiful and your dog loves to eat and you're not tainting the food and they're really enjoying their food but you still wanna get zizastin, zizanthin, astaxanthin into them. You can do a power smoothie, you can do a meatball, if you have a dog that eats anything, you're welcome to put supplements in the bowl. But I think what's really important is you need to know why you're giving supplements to your dog. And remember that the supplements that your dog are on at birth usually are not the exact same protocol as they go through life. So supplements need to dynamically change as they go through life to meet your dog where they're at because their, dog, their body is dynamically changing over time. So as their body goes through the aging process, sometimes there's slips, trips, or falls, there's accidents, you're gonna add supplements in during those periods. And then when things are going great and your dog doesn't need supplements, you're welcome to discontinue. So it's kind of this ebb and flow. You don't have to panic if you don't get them in there one meal. It is important though that you are um, switching your protocol enough to recognize that you're meeting the needs of your dog where they're at at that time space reality. It's a great question. All right, Michelle from Southampton, New Jersey, United States. Hello, Michelle. Hello, Michelle. Uh, thank you for your tireless efforts to get this information out to those of us in need through the Inside mm. Scoop, the Learning Lab, and many of your social media posts. What will happen to the remaining 400 pages? I'm hoping for a Forever Dog 2.0. Now, of course, Michelle is referencing, as we had said earlier, that the book, we were only allowed to fill it with, we had like 450 page limit of all the things that we wanted to say. Um, I think one of the big things that hurt me to have to take out you know we alluded to this in 2017 where we said to people hey man a lot of you want like recipes a lot of people want sick dog recipes right like what are some things i can make or what if um i'm already feeding like a certain type of pet food how can i make that pet food better like how can i enhance it or, now or i'm never going to switch my food exactly never switch my food help me help my dog yeah first let me just say this 
there, <laughs> that's all that this book is, is trying to tell you what to do. But there was some things that we had to take out, of course. So Michelle, to answer your question, um, I know some people have been lobbying for a forever cat. Yes. Everybody wants a forever cat. So yep. we, we kind of threw that out into the social sphere and to Harper see what Co people Harper wanted. And Harper Collins, if you're watching, our awesome publisher. Yep. People would like a forever cat. So, so. smash in the comment section mm -hmm. if the forever cat is where you would like to see us go next or We've knocked around a sick dog cookbook and compiled with the sick. So in addition to liver disease, heart disease, musculoskeletal disease, autoimmune disease, like liver disease, kidney disease, cognitive decline, everything that dogs suffer from, we could create a customized therapeutic nutritional guided protocol for those disease processes. That's one option or, or, well, let me just say this. We jump on a plane, we travel around the world, and we see what some of the longest lived dogs were also eating, some of the most beneficial things that you can put in food, and maybe a longevity slash sick dog recipe book, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are all the things we're, we're open to suggestions. Yeah, we're open. As you can see, go ahead in the comment section. Yeah, we're taking Give us uh, your thoughts. votes as to what the next project should be. Okay, next question. We gotta, we gotta rock through these questions quick, man. All, All right. right, Kathy from St. Peter's, Missouri, United States. Uh, so many suggestions to boost the bowl. It's so true, Kathy, it's overwhelming. In fact, we have to just touch on this. Rodney is, and be both diehard educators. They they put out, all, each and every one of those beautiful pictures that you saw on our Facebook pages were personally taken by B or Rodney. Gorgeous photos. They love food, they love teaching about food. I love reducing food fears. Like my primary goal in life is to help everyone that hears of the concept of intentionally creating health through wise lifestyle choices, you're gonna have to address food fears because we all come to the table with previous biases, misinformation, historical, uh, un, you know, learn, unlearn, re relearn, which is what I had to do from veterinary school. So what I was taught in vet school is feed the same food from birth till death. Well, we know now that it's undisputable. That is not the best suggestion for long-term health and well-being. We know that feeding the exact same food day after day, month after month, year after year is not the recipe for longevity. And we had every single expert tell us. In fact, probably the most impactful interview comment that I have heard was Dr. Tim Spector. Do you wanna talk a little bit about his statement when you said, you know, what about feeding a scientifically formulated little brown piece of kibble um, that has everything in it? What was his response? Well, one of, of course, he, he thought that that may be the worst decision that you could ever make to feed your pet because as many microbiologists will tell you, the more diverse your gut biome is, the more diverse your pet's microbiome is, the longer and healthier they should live. In fact, if you look at some of the longest lived people in the world, I know the Hansa tribe is one of them, the American Gut Project, the largest citizen science microbiome project put together, they found that these, these tribesmen were consuming almost 600 different plants a year and that the typical North American should be consuming at least 30 different types of vegetables a week, right? So diversity is critical. And sometimes these foods that we're feeding our pets are sterile foods, right? You have to sort of destroy the microbiome in these foods because, well, what's a carrot supposed to do eventually after a while? The microbiome activates itself and the carrot rots. That's why we put our foods in the refrigerator. Well, pet food manufacturers are aware of that, right? They can't have the food rotting inside the bag. So if you can't refrigerate it, it has to be a shelf-stable product, a shelf stable product. You have to heat the heck out of it. You have to heat the heck out of it. You got to destroy the microbiome of that product so it doesn't activate inside the bag and start to decay and rot on you. Of course, there's additives that are also added in that. It's the same thing with human food. This isn't just an animal food shelf stable situation. But now you're feeding these sterile foods and the gut biome, according to these scientists, is not looking ideal. And so Tim Spector was very clear on diversity. So in the book, we got a giant section called Mending the Microbiome where we give you a whole bunch of tips, add-ons, prebiotics to feed the probiotics to create the postbiotics, the magic that happens when you marry the two together. I also notice a lot of people that are jumping in, and I always feel bad. People are throwing their comment sections in there. So of course, this looks like I, yeah, yeah this yeah. looks like a big live. So just remember, there's a link on the bottom if you wanna enter the portal to put your questions. So uh, we won't, we're not checking them in the comment sections per se directly of this live, but- um, But for people that don't know who Tim Spector is, he is was like one of the most cited scientists in the entire world, according to Reuters magazine. One percent of the most cited scientists in the world from King College of the United Kingdom. 
He's doing he's, the twin he's studies kind of a down there. Specialist. He's a microbiome yeah. guru. Where we yeah. flew down to, uh, we flew all the way down to the United Kingdom to and, sit down and with him. Even looking when looking at the microbiologist examining feral dogs, wild dogs, homeless dogs. When you look at a homeless dog's microbiome, not to mention compared to captive, raised and carnivores, as well as wild members of the dog family, dingoes, jackals, coyotes, wolves. Looking at all wild dogs, domesticated dogs, um, homeless dogs, looking at their microbiome, they are substantially more diversified than our incredibly well-loved pets, which makes you stop and think. These animals aren't necessarily well-loved. In fact, they're in high-risk environment, and of course they're parasitized. They're in unsafe environments. They're homeless. But interestingly, they're eating everything. And by eating everything that they can come across, they have a diverse, resilient, strong microbiome. And one of the things that every longevity scientist mentioned to us, two things that every single scientist mentioned is the stress component. And that was something, that's another piece that I was a little happy about, but also surprised that every single scientist wanted to talk about what are people doing to control dog stress? Because anxiety is a massive issue right now. Our domestic well-loved dogs are having a lot of stress and anxiety in the home. The pandemic hasn't helped. So every researcher wanted to talk about stress and every researcher wanted to talk about the microbiome. So those are two things that I think when I think about what's most important to think about on a daily basis, it's those two things. Well, one of the scary things is all the new data and the research that's coming out today is showing that they're actually analyzing dogs and cats because they spend the most time at home, according to scientists. Yeah, really good. So they're finding, why are they testing dogs and cats? Because they want to see how toxic the home is. Because they're home more than we are, our dogs and cats are accumulating the most phthalates, the most like, like acrolines, the, all these different types of chemicals, these home chemicals from the solutions that we're using in our home to clean our homes and to sanitize our homes with, from the air fresheners and scented products that we're using within our home, frying foods in your home. Like who thought that frying foods might be that big of a deal? It is according to scientists. These dogs are having four times the levels of chemicals from frying in their house it's a than pant, ever before. Right? It's, it's the, pant, the pants that we're using, the stuff we're spraying, the uh, ant killers we're using. We have people come into our homes and put down chemicals on and around the home. We don't think about how that influences the microbiome. We don't think about a lot of those things. So we, I really enjoyed each scientist we went to gave us a new set of kind of variables to consider. And I really enjoyed the individuality of the interviews with all of those top longevity researchers. Was this all Kathy's question? Kathy? No. <laughs> Kathy said, there's so many different things you can add in. Yeah, that was actually, you're right. We're still on Kathy's question from 20 minutes ago. Sorry, Kathy, you're probably waiting. Add in whatever's in your fridge, first of all. And you know, the other thing, the comment I loved from Dr. David Sinclair, he said, you know, all of those um, blueberries that are kind of soft and mushy and dented, those have the highest polyphenol concentration. So he, Dr. Xenohormesis. Sinclair said, yeah, xenohormesis. He said, you eat the perfect blueberry and all the ones that looks a little soft and mushy that are like that. Nah, I mean, they're, you could eat them, but they're kind of, you know, they're kind of that mushy flavor on the inside. Give those to your dogs. Those have the highest polyphenols, but also if a little off, your dog doesn't give two hoots. If you give him the dented part of the banana or the dented part of the apple, feed those Kathy. So to answer your question, my answer to Kathy's question is how often do you need to rotate? Kathy, rotate as much as you can. Feed as many different bites of variable foods as you can at a pace that your dog's GI tract will allow. If you have a dog with IBD, IBS, gastritis, colitis, you're gonna go slow. You're gonna pick bland veggies. But if you have a dog that has a gut of steel because you have been watching us forever and you know that your primary goal in life is to create a gut of steel and you've done it, treat away with everything from your fridge. One of the things I can say, and you know, it, being a fresh food feeder like yourself, a lot of us are like, well, if we're rotating between the brands, what's the big deal? Um, we do, Kathy, a lot of citizen science projects with our nonprofit, Pause for Change. And can we just recently, your nonprofit just did a, uh, up here in Canada where we, they analyzed a whole bunch of fresh food companies. Believe it or not, you'd actually be shocked. This isn't intentional by these companies, but the labels sometimes don't reflect what's actually inside the ingredients, especially when it comes to vitamins and minerals. So not only is rotation important, but if you don't start bringing in other categories, just in case that diet doesn't meet what's required on that label. You mean other brands. Other brands, other excuse brands. me. You're gonna cut other yourself brands. really short, right? Like, so for me, let's, if I was staying within a brand, I'm always rotating other brands, but if I stayed within a brand, yes, I am rotating through things in my refrigerator, through things I'm gonna get in the farmer's market, so on and so forth, because I'm 
I'm worried mm -hmm. that maybe it's missing something. So if you want to go on to Dr. Becker's page on Canwe, check out some of the and results. Actually, it's not it's not Canwe. It's a Canadian raw food project. Oh, so, yes. so you know yeah. I said Canwe. Yes. But, Apologies. But Canwe did do the advanced glycation end product That's study, correct. which right. actually had massive implications for gut biome as well. So what Canwe, what the Companion Animal Nutrition and Wellness Institute found is that when you heat foods at really high temperatures, there can be some unwanted byproducts in the food that can negatively, they literally age your dog's body. And so high heat processing creates unwanted byproducts that negatively impact health. There's just no way around it. So our, one of our suggestions in our book, pick the food that is processed at the lowest temperature that you can afford to feed. Pick that food and then rotate through all of the brands that you can find in that category that's a great suggestion but let's just say that you can't rotate foods you're staying on one food if you if you can first of all find a set of fresh foods that your dog loves and just rotate through those that's great but then begin building the microbiome by trying new foods from your fridge small bites to begin diversifying your dog's microbiome when it comes to like I mean, if you can grate turmeric that's fantastic if your dog will eat mushrooms even better MCT oil is a great add-in. So those are everything you've listed is fantastic. But the key is don't be overwhelmed. Go at a pace that makes it enjoyable and non-stressful for you and not stressful for your dog so you can enjoy the journey. Well said. Caroline. Caroline said, I'm nervous about bacteria in pet food in general. Um, is there a problem with bacterial resistance? So Caroline, there's a problem with factory farm meats going into anything. So just briefly, when we do CAFO, when we do high concentration animal feed operations where a lot of chickens are jammed together or a lot of you know cows are jammed together in a very small amount of space, it's obviously biologically stressful for those animals that then become meat. It just is. Animals, food production animals, so animals that we raise for the purpose of turning into meat, those animals, what they eat, the environment they are in, and the stress level infects the quality of their meat, but it also affects their bacterial loads. And what we know is some of these animals are kept in such unhealthy, inhumane conditions that they have to go on antibiotics for a large part of their life, and it's the antibiotic resistance in meats that humans are eating, and in turn, meats that get into both the ultra processed pet food arena as well as the minimally processed pet food arena that are that the antibiotic resistance issue can be passed up the food chain so it comes down to sourcing absolutely sourcing is critical i know that in the media as of late there was like a lot of attack on raw foods and i know they were saying that of course the feeding of raw foods could create some of these antibiotic resistant issues. I will say there are multiple studies that are out there that are showing this is not just a specific food category. This is not only just a problem in the pet food space, this is a problem globally, right? So and, this, and this is also well. happening in yeah. ultra processed dry yeah. food yeah. as Can well. Foods. So it's a massive global issue. Sourcing of food has never become so, it's always been important. But now you're seeing through st study after study how important, like the detrimental effects of eating factory farm meats are, right? And the detrimental effects of any animal being under the influence of antibiotics for months and well, months and, and months. Well, and I didn't know that they were they would yeah. feed, you know, speaking with farmers, why on earth are you feeding antibiotics to your cows? When you destroy the microbiome of a cow, they put on weight faster. So I had no idea that some of these farmers were purposely feeding antibiotics to be able to grow the cattle faster, right? So this is a problem, right? Because Dogs and cats, of course, are eating the the leftover ends, if you may, the byproducts of the human industry. So they're getting a lot of those tainted antibiotics meats. Antibiotics yeah, are being passed absolutely. up the food chain. And antibiotic okay. resistant bacteria being passed up the food Let's chain. Look at this one. So sourcing, it's I, about sourcing. I like this one. I love this one too. Ac Acacia from Arizona. Uh, hello, Acacia from Buckeye, Arizona. I am in Fountain Hills, Arizona, now, now Acacia, but I will be in two weeks. Acacia would like a shout out to her babies. And I love this. She said, if I may, I'd like a shout out to my dachshund, Gracie May, who's going to be 16. Yay, Woo happy birthday. Gracie May, keep going, girl, <laughs> keep going. 16 is awesome, love it. As well as her Rhodesian Ridgeback, our, our churros, our cur I hope I'm saying that right, mm -hmm. our, our churros, uh, six years old, on Arturos. September 3rd. Arturos, 
beautiful. A Ridgey? Shout out to both your dogs. Listen, you're four years away from setting the Guinness World Book of Record for the 10th oldest dog in the world if you can hit 20. Keep so going. Just keep going, Come man. on, Gracie Mae. You stop. got this. You got this. Your mama has a book. It's coming. And nice job, Acacia. Thank you for um, this will be really great information to uh, to for a forever dog for both your babies. Thank you. Colleen says, um, oh, actually, we have several people saying, let's talk about allergies. Several people had questions about allergies. So let me just, you sign, because I, to be honest, I'm a little bit ahead of you. <laughs> let's just talk about allergies. There's, You're a good multitasker, by the way. <laughs> I, I, well, I'm also a fast signer. Okay, so allergies. A couple, we actually have, I think, four questions, and they're all very similar. So, I'm, Colleen, I'm going to lump uh, your allergy question in with some of the other questions pertaining to allergies. Let me say this. Um, there are two types of allergies, food allergies and environmental allergies, and they look the same. You can have some idea what's going on without spending a dime if your dog is just seasonally itchy and then you get to a different change in temperature and things go away, chances are it's environment. So ragweed, grass, pollen, all through the grass, it's brewing through the grass and breathe in all those allergens, ragweed, grasses, pollens, molds, breathe them in and his or her immune system should say, it's pollen, no big thing. What happens with any allergic situation is the immune system overreacts. And the immune system treats a uh, ragweed, grass, or pollen like a foreign invader. And there's this massive immune system reaction that creates these massive inflammatory, itchy, swelling, all those side effects that make your dog miserable. So though that's seasonal environmental allergies. Food allergies, the exact same thing happens. Animals eat food. Instead of the gut being a strong, resilient barrier, the gut allows in partially digested proteins in the immune system and says, ah, and mounts an immune system reaction against that. So it's this overactive immune system. Are you done signing? No, I was just waiting for my turn to talk. Oh, so what I will say about allergies is that whether it's food or environmental, if it's food, you've got year round issues. You need to um, put your animal on a novel protein source that he's never, he or she's never had before and really focus on rebuilding the gut. If you have environmental issues, you can do a ton of th natural things to help decrease the body's histamine reaction. And we do cover some of those in the book. Yes, I think you already are doing uh, paw rinses. We have the paw rinse recipe in the book. That's a really easy way. Irrigation therapy, rinsing those allergens off your dog is simple, easy. So if the irritants are on the outside of the body causing this irritation, you and I shower enough that we can rinse those things off our body. So just rinsing them off your dog's paws is super smart. It reduces irritation. But you can also do nature's Benadryl. Quercetin is a natural anti-inflammatory. You can do things to naturally decrease the irritation. Did you talk about the microbiome? I didn't. All right. Colleen, one of the best pieces of advice I can give you would be see a microbiologist. If you have the opportunity to get your dog's microbiome checked, that is critical, right? One of the biggest issues today, and according to a lot of microbiologists, is they predict like over 50% of dogs could be suffering from leaky gut dysbiosis. And so if you've got dys dysbiosis going on in your dog's GI system, it doesn't matter how much, you know, turkey tail you do, it doesn't matter how much supplement you do. If you've got holes in the GI system that you're not addressing, you are just going to have a like a monsoon of chronic low grade inflammation going on in that dog. I just have to jump in and say you don't have to physically see the microbiologist. You can do a quick test. You can take a swab of your dog's poop send it to a microbiome analyzing laboratory and they will tell you how to help how to help fix your dog's gut and once you 70% of your dog's immune system is located in his or her gut so by addressing your dog's gut you are addressing their immune system and the goal is not to turn the immune system off and not to stimulate the immune system the goal is to have a functional healthy balanced immune system reaction and we do that by focusing on the gut removing topical irritants that create the inflammation using natural supplements to decrease the histamine release and last but not least you can desensitize your dog to environmental allergens there are oral drops you can give there are things you can do to incrementally help your dog's immune system now, quiet down to environmental yeah, and let me say this to go back to the microbiologist if they do analyze the gi system you might find you know that the the gut bacteria is all out of whack fusobacteria is low which is a bacteria responsible for the breakdown of protein megamonas which is responsible for like your dog's overall metabolism so on and so forth they will send you an fmt which is called a fecal microbiome transplant sometimes that can be magic itself so talk to your vet
try to get to a either a microbiologist or as Dr. Karen Becker alludes to a lab because there's yeah. a lot of labs out there that will test your dog's gut biome that can really help with anybody that's listening that has dogs with allergies. All right. Sandra says, um, S- Sandra has uh, autoimmune. She is from Ontario. She says, oh, you are my heroes. Oh, Shout so out to sweet. my fellow so Canuck. So sweet. So sweet. Um, she says that she's having um, information, any information you can uh, provide for immune system issues. She has a dog with meningi- autoimmune meningitis, and he was controlled, and now he's out of control. So, Sandra, your dog falls into that category of that hyperactive immune system. So on the immune spectrum, balance is in the middle. Over here, you have an underactive immune system. That's where cancer hangs out, chronic infection, then cancer. Here's healthy. Here you have allergies. Here you have autoimmune disease. That's where the immune system attacks, your dog's own immune system attacks his or her own body. So you are correct in the things that you've already done. You want to do nothing to stimulate an already confused immune system. So yes, you're going to titer forever and ever and ever. Yes, you're going to not give any immune stimulating substances, nutraceuticals, or supplements. You're going to give immune modulating supplements or immune balancing supplements. So mushrooms actually are, what is what I would tell you when you asked about supplements, what would you add in? Mushrooms are amazing because they can help the immune system recalibrate and have a normal response where previously the immune system has been overactive. So I know that he's having a little bit of a flare up and mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms could be of benefit. Uh, there's a mushroom called uh, activated hexose correlated compound AHCC that can be also really beneficial for autoimmune conditions. Emily says, uh, is there any 24 seven hotline you can call if your dog eats something he's not supposed to? Emily is from Wisconsin. Emily, animal Con- poison control, 888-426-4435, but they, they charge you 65 bucks. So we do have an animal poison control hotline you can call. Now, I do, the fee's warranted because you're going to talk to a toxic, a veterinary toxicologist who's giving you professional, accurate, and and life-saving information. So if you think that your dog has ingested something that could be life-threatening, pay the 65 bucks and get the expert opinion. It's frustrating uh, that there's a fee involved, but call and, and definitely pay the 65 bucks. Yeah. Lauren from... Moline, Illinois. Did I say that right? Moline. Moline. See, in Canada, Moline. man. We, I, as a Canadian, I struggle with all the U.S. states. Illinois, United States. Moline says, what did each of you need in your writing space to help you stay focused? Uh, well, signing autographs and then talking at the same time is hard for me. <laughs> Rodney does not multitask well. And I think that that's okay because whatever he's focused on, he's like 100% focused. When I, uh, I wrote for a year and a half straight and I think my, I think some of my family is watching here. Hi mom. Hi dad. Hi family. They watched me cry tears of joy and frustration and happiness and sadness and grief. You definitely work through all the emotions when you're writing. For me, when I was writing every day, I mean, every day for a year and a half. And in one way, that was the blessing of the pandemic for me is when the world came to a screeching halt and you almost got smacked down. Like all of us, at least me, I went into shock. I'm like, what is going on? I took this as an opportunity to sit down and start writing. And how I got into writing mode was flow. I would really, I would do some yoga and meditate, get myself into a really good cognitive space every morning, get into flow and then write. And when I could feel myself coming out of flow and the words weren't coming and I would hit writer's block or get frustrated, stop, take a little breather, walk the dog, train the cats, make a snack, do something. But I tried to get into flow to not force my writing. How about you? Did you say you did cat training to, I tr- to listen, relieve yourself I told you. of stress? L- <laughs> That's I, pretty intense, man. L- mostly during COVID, I trained my cats to do like 59 <laughs> crazy circus <laughs> tricks, like crazy. Like they're right. unbelievable. You can click or train a goldfish if you want to. How do you, I beat that? I can't even top that. How, how do you beat cat like, training? Callie would jump through hoops, <laughs> okay. like a series of hoops. Right. Okay. Well... For myself, man, lots and lots of coffee. Let me tell you, I would get up. I would get up super early. So the only way really to stay focused was get up super early. I found like the in the morning. I remember um, hanging out with a good friend, Stephen. Uh, which I should say like he's not my best friend, but a really good guy, Stephen Kotler. And the best piece of advice he gave me, he said to me, "Man, get up early." 
because the dogs you know what it's like when the dogs wake up it's because it's all about the dogs at that point so get up before the dogs get up work as much as you can that's good advice so lots of coffee got up early and then lots of walks man uh, just to sort of to break my thoughts a lot of those images that we needed to create for the book yeah. those were those were probably the hardest images I had to make like typically when you take a photograph and you post it online or you make a video it's, it's easy right but when you have to do something for a book it becomes graphic it was really tough and then create a graphic that all the world can understand so a child can look at it know what's going on to uh, like a baby boomer that look at it to go on so lots of coffee lots of, lots of walks got up real early but mm -hmm. I am going to take up cat training when I have the you. opportunity. It was amazing. And the, the best part is those of you that have um, trained your cats uh, to do circus tricks, like Callie's super excited. Like she really wants to work now. Like it's her job. She's like, all right, are we training or what? Like I love it. I can't wait to go back. I'll, I'll show it to you. All right. All right. So. Um, Gosh, I think we've like got eight minutes. I know. Uh, so how important questions. is it to vary proteins in a diet? Lucy, Lucy from Ontario, how important is it to vary in any diet? Not, not just raw, cooked, canned. Lucy, the more diversity you can provide your body, your cat's body, everyone in your family would benefit from diversifying the microbiome, including your dogs and cats and anything else you have. So I love your suggestion and I couldn't agree more. Don't just rotate between if you're buying food between different brands, which is really important, rotate as many different diversities of proteins as you can. So for instance, if you've typically given a lot of poultry, let's say duck, pheasant, chicken, quail, fine. That's a lot of birds. Get some red meat in there, get a little elk, get some bison going, get a little goat, get some rabbit going. The more you can diversify the amino acids coming in or the spectrum of fatty acids coming in, the more different nutrients you can provide to your dog's body, the healthier and the more resilient their immune system will be. Well, and less risk of developing some sort of allergy. If you ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches your whole life from birth to death, you may develop a peanut butter allergy, mm -hmm. right? So it's very good, just simple layman term to, to rotate through proteins. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next one here? What would you, um, Fra Francis from, Oh, oh gosh. The Philippines. The Philippines. Manila. Manila. I love it. Francis what kind of so diet awesome. would you suggest to help anxious dogs feel better and less stress? Mm, well so good. Boy, there's a there's a ton of research right now, um, Francis, when it comes to macronutrients. If you just want to talk about macronutrients, mm -hmm. um, there's a, a bunch of studies that are out there that showing that dogs that are on a good clean fat source, less carbohydrate fat source. Less starch. anxious, yeah. right? Less starch in the diet, less glucose spikes, less insulin spikes. Lots of insulin leads to chronic inflammation. Not a good thing. Um, can help alleviate with stress. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. Same with humans. If we can work on increasing the nutrition, most humans are overfed and undernourished. Nourished meaning vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids, phytonutrients, and biomolecules that have a physiologic effect. A lot of dogs eating processed food and people eating processed food, we're, we're plenty, our body weight's good, but our nutritional status is not great. And that's true of dogs as well. So I couldn't agree more. Offset, in the book, we, we're gonna show you how to do the carb equation. In fact, that's one of the three equations of pet food homework. And Francis, you will be able to do pet food homework, these three simple equations, and you'll be able to look at not just the bag of food that you're feeding or the recipe that you're feeding. This criteria is used to objectively evaluate any food that you're thinking about feeding, that you wanna feed, that your neighbor feeds, that you've been told to feed, we are going to give you, we're teaching you how to do objective evaluation of any type of food so that you know in your heart it's exactly what you think you're feeding. And in this situation, specifically for anxiety, if you can get those sugar, the carb down less than 20%, get the amount of lean proteins up. So great proteins, turkey for instance, has a lot of tryptophan, which is fantastic for neurochemical balance and creating serotonin. You can also do supplements. We have a section in the book uh, for teas you can add, easy, simple, calming teas. You can do chamomile tea. You can do valerian. You can add supplements in like bacopa that actually has similar profile of anti-anxiety medication, but it's an herb. So there are this multimodal effect of feeding an anti-inflammatory calming diet, anti-inflammatory calming supplements, along with a lot of heart thumping daily, brain enhancing exercise, 
it's a good start to manage. Yeah, keep, keeping that gut biome is just keeping that gut biome healthy in general is so critical when it comes to stress and well being. The gut brain access, healthy gut, healthy brain, as they say. I know they were doing research on mice. You know, they had depressed mice, happy mice by feeding by feeding the poop of happy mice to depressed mice. The depressed mice all of a sudden became happy. So a lot of stresses can actually start from the GI system. Mm -hmm. So if you can start looking into diets that can all enhance the gut, you can enhance the brain. I even know that Purina came out with that calming care where they patented a probiotic. It was bifidobacterium. The strain was BL999. Just by adding probiotic, good bacteria. The point of this, not to run out and buy that probiotic, but the point of it is just by adding bacteria they did a study I think there was like a 90% efficacy rate on some reduction of stress in anxious dogs in that study mm -hmm. that's how important gut bacteria is so yes foods rich in gut bacteria yeah very good uh, Louise so beautiful from Alberta she says I just want to say thanks to both of you for your hard Another work and dedication happy Thanksgiving thank you, Louise. thank you Louise so awesome thank you so much love all right we gotta get to a couple okay. more questions quick um, so uh, Rhiannon from Tennessee says, what are the top three contributing factors that prevent our beloved companion dogs from living longer, healthier, and more enriched lives? Oh, good question. L should we do speed run? Yeah, go. Okay. Uh, gosh, the top three contributing factors. I'm going to say a biologically inappropriate diet, significant lack of exercise, and as us as guardians not recommending stress, our dogs have a lot. So did I just steal your thunder? Well, you, you just broke down basically okay. so I'll, diet. I'll do the first two. Yeah, you just food, you broke down food, dogs. You just broke matters. down dogs. F food matters yeah. and um, exercise. Exercise. Dogs um, are not getting nearly enough exercise. But I think for you? A, I think that was a really good question. I think that's another question coming down here. So I'm going to save it and defer to you. Okay. Great answer. We got to move quick. Okay. Um. Okay, two questions in a row. People saying, I'm having a hard time talking to my veterinarian. Two in a row, people saying, my vet does, I don't know how to talk to my vet. <sighs> this is a growing question I get as a veterinarian. And here's my suggestion. Just as humans, we have a general practitioner. You know, we might have a cardiologist. We might have a podiatrist. Depending on what's wrong with our bodies, we may have a dermatologist a chiropractor, an acupuncturist, a nutritionist, uh, whatever else. We, we a la carte medicine to take the best care of our bodies. And I believe the days of the country veterinarian being able to do surgery on cows and horses and pigs and dogs and cats and macaws and being able to be a cardiologist, an internist, a radiologist, those days of that one doctor doing everything, we can't. None of us have all those skills. So veterinarians are wisely choosing to focus on one area of medicine and kind of focus on that and hold it there. If your veterinarian says to you, I'm uncomfortable with things outside of my skill set, our job isn't as clients is not to make them feel bad or guilty. Our job is to say, I am an empowered guardian and I have taken uh, an oath to myself. I made a promise to my dog that I am going to become the most knowledgeable advocate for the animals in my care. And that means that I'm going to make decisions. I, I'm going to pay you on a partner with you, veterinarian, because you are my go-to. You're the doctor. You have the medical training. But I am in charge of making the best decisions. And that means that I have to become informed and knowledgeable. And I'm a partner with you. But I need to call the shots. And we're having a different philosophy. I view things this way. And this is the direction I want to go in. And I'm asking you to partner with me so that we can have this synergistic health and wellness team for my beloved animal that I am doing everything I can. So are you willing to help me? I understand that we disagree, but this is what I want to do. And this is how I want to go about doing it. I'm asking that you partner with me for the betterment of my dog's body. That's the conversation I recommend you have. You know, I think one of the hardest things for me originally, you know, when you when your dog is sick, your vet is basically your almost like plays a role of God, right? They need to fix your dog. And I have so many vets that are friends on like my, my and like half of my social media platforms are just a lot of incredible veterinarians. I know they go through a lot of stuff. And so if you can't talk to your vet, oh my gosh, you are signing so aggressively. I I'm can't sorry. concentrate. <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, because I feel all that. You know what? Because I'm a goal oriented creature, <laughs> and I'm like, it's been an hour, and we're not done. So I was just trying yes. to finish my. So task, let me say but... this: one, so it, you know, it's hard for me to back in the olden days to want to communicate with your veterinarian. It's really important as a pet parent that you understand, man. These guys have stressful, yeah. friggin' jobs. Super stressful, super intense. They got to see sick animals all the time. They got to euthanize animals. Listen, it's it's a position. And thank you for saying that. Yeah, be it's kind. a position. Yes. It's a position I would never want to be yes. in. I know that you know they're under a lot of duress, man. So, one of the things that I would do, one of my tips was, I would just surprise my vet with like presents. I would, if Mister, if Doctor Jones was working out that day, I take him a coffee. If there was a study or something I wanted him to see, if there was something new, sort of in the vet space, he's so busy, he's seeing dogs or she's seeing dogs and she doesn't have the opportunity, I'd send the email or. Uh, like a gentle email. Hey, got you a coffee today. Oh, by the way, did you check out this really cool study? That was my yeah. way of saying, hey, did you check this out? Maybe that's not a cup of tea for your be- uh, vet, but there's always a cool way to communicate. I talk to a lot of pet parents that will make like cookies and things like well, that when they go and they talk to their vet. It's not about like wooing your vet with stuff. I think it's about kindness. You, that is a really important point that the goal isn't, no one likes to be hammered. And veterinarians, we have the hardest jobs, I think, subjectively it may be in the the world um it's hard so speaking to your veterinarian with love and kindness and acceptance is really uh impressive uh, michelle, michelle says i take, I take donuts, donuts to my to vet my, every listen, time i go we're, i'm not saying we don't like gifts listen everyone like no, it sounded donut. like you did that's right <laughs> you're but, like don't woo your vet well, i was like well what, man what, I, that vet, kind of... what, what veterinarians want is compassion and kindness from our of clients course. what we want we don't need to we understand we're not going to agree we don't need any more pain and stress than we are already all under. So, but I do think that it is a, an opportunity. If your vet and you are not agreeing on topics, it's okay. The key is ki- with kindness and patience, ask if you can still utilize your veterinary services, you love them and you trust them, but that you're gonna have to agree to disagree on some topics that you feel strongly about. And then what's awesome, is that by you being the advocate for your animals, partnering with your veterinarian, this also means that you may need to get two or three different veterinarians on your health yeah, team. You may end yeah. up getting a proactive veterinarian. You may end up with a rehab veterinarian. You may end up with an internal medicine doctor. You're gonna a la carte your services for your animals a little bit like you a la carte your own body. It's just like a football team, right? When you have a head coach and you have so many other coaches, you know, I talk to pet parents all the time. That's a really good point. It's okay to have more than one vet, yeah. right? It's okay to get different opinions. Yeah. You may have a vet that specializes in one thing, maybe something in another, a vet that has an interest in one thing versus a vet that doesn't. Maybe you have a vet that has interest in functional foods or b- proactive medicine. You have another vet that's a conventional doctor that has conventional wisdom. You have a vet that's holistic. Whatever the case may be, you don't have to just have one vet. You can have multiple vets. But more importantly, they are the coach on your team to help your dog to live forever. So it's critical that you like your vet and your vet likes you because that's always really important in a relationship. And I think that the more wise opinions you can collect about any area, especially if you're confused, if you're in a state of confusion, you gaining clarity by helping, like reading information, learning about what's happening in your dog's body that's causing the confusion, learning as much as you can as an empowered guardian, super important. So you can have intelligent conversations without fear or being overwhelmed. But then collecting people on your healthcare team is going to give you the confidence that you have enough opinions to make the best decision. Pet parents of the world, I know that the great folks over at Premier Collectibles, there's the link down there if you want an autograph copy. They gave us an hour. I know we we blow, we blow over it. We, 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 we never we never over. we never could ever meet the rules. We appreciate all of you. We appreciate all of you who tuned in. We appreciate all of you who uh, have supported the Forever yeah. Dog Volk. We, this was maybe one of the hardest things that I've ever had to put together. I, I wish it could have been 10,000 pages because I could have filled it with my eyes closed. But hey, there's always, there's always next time. We also, we also wish we could have gone around and met you all in indie pet stores, uh, pet specialty retailers at a park somewhere. We might. At a local coffee we might. Shop, listen, a listen. We I'm gonna. To... I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed for for yeah. a better world where things open back up again. We can see you all. We can start traveling around the world again and sitting down with people and. You in know, the meantime, in the meantime, thank you, thank Premier you. Collectibles. Thank you, Premier Collectibles. Yes, thank you for this available. allowing this live signing. You know, we were blessed and humbled that you uh, you took us on and you allowed us to use uh, yeah. your your platform to be able for us to be able to spread our word. Again, thank you. 
I hope this guide not only I just hope all of us get forever dogs for however long fate and the universe has it that our, our dogs need to live for. I really hope this book inspires you. It inspires you for a content creator to create a lot of videos. It inspires you for a pet parent to want to do better because when you know better, you do better. Thank you all for being on this journey with us. Those of you that have just heard about us, you just bought the book, welcome. We can't wait for every single one of you to get this book and resource in your hands. Thank you for supporting this journey. Thank you for recognizing this movement of us intentionally creating wellness through wise lifestyle choices. We are removing lifestyle obstacles to prevent degeneration from occurring. And the end result is a forever dog. And you, by default, are longevity junkies because you are the ones that are making that quiet commitment to be everything you can to your dog. And we love you guys for it. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.